Optix has built a platform for SQL-powered security analytics. Extending the OS query agent, Optix collects, aggregates, and analyzes a wide range of system data and makes that available to solve multiple security challenges. Their solution provides visibility across Linux, macOS, Windows, containers, and cloud workloads. Their customers are using the Uptix platform for fleet visibility, intrusion detection, investigation, and audit and compliance. Visit securityweekly.com forward slash Uptix and be one of the first to see how they've mapped over 500 behavioral rules to the MITRE ATT&CK framework. Data protection is a top priority with today's work from home workforce. However, current data loss prevention tools inadequately protect data in cloud or SaaS offerings from insider threats. Secure Circle automatically protects data as it leaves SaaS services such as GitHub, AWS, and Salesforce. The protection is transparent to users and works with any application to persistently protect data, even source code. Secure your data with Secure Circle Zero Trust Data Protection. Begin your 30-day free trial by visiting securityweekly.com forward slash secure circle. You want to get the right things done for your security program. Sounds simple. But what are the right things for you? What does done mean? And how are you going to get there? Rapid7 realizes more than anyone how hard this can be. While Rapid7's Insight platform offers you industry-leading vulnerability management and detection and response solutions, their focus is on understanding where you are so that they can help you get where you're going. Visit securityweekly.com forward slash Rapid7 to get started. Welcome back to Enterprise Security Weekly. Do you always end up missing our live streams? Need somewhere to flag Security Weekly podcasts that you want to listen to? Subscribe to your favorite podcast catcher, our YouTube channel, and sign up for our mailing list and join our Discord server. To stay in the loop on all things Security Weekly by visiting securityweekly.com forward slash subscribe. This segment is sponsored by Red Seal. To learn more, please visit securityweekly.com forward slash Red Seal. Joining us today from Red Seal is CTO Mike Lloyd to discuss how we can vaccinate our networks. Mike, welcome to the program. Hey, pleasure to be here. Always good to talk to you guys. Now, Mike, when, when we talk about this uh, particular topic and related to information security, I think for our ESW listeners, perhaps describe a little bit of your background that makes you more of an authority than many other folks on this particular topic. Sure. Well, you know, um, if you like, if I go far uh, far enough back, I've been working on about the same problem for about 35 years now. We just call it different things. Mm-hmm. Um, once upon a time, I was an epidemiologist in, in, in the mid 80s, um, meaning I was studying how diseases would spread. Mm-hmm. And well, one of the funny things about uh, being an epidemiologist is I used to have to explain to people what that was. Right. Um, nowadays with the pandemic, everybody kind of understands what epidemiologists mm-hmm. do. But uh, so, so in the 80s, I was figuring out how diseases spread through populations. And then I figured out, you know, networks are kind of like that. With, with mm. the, the way networks do routing, well, one router learns about stuff connected to it. And you can think of those like infection, and they spread it to their neighbors, and they spread it to their neighbors. And so the whole internet looks like a virus process. Mm-hmm. And so I ended up uh, spending about 10 years in, in the 90s working on network management, on network control, trying to understand complicated networks, because humans aren't very good at that. Um, then in the uh-ohs, uh, you took the same idea and made it into active network control just for performance reasons, measuring networks and then controlling them and changing them to try and get higher performance out of them because that was what was important in mm-hmm. the go-go days of the internet. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then somewhere in the tens, we realized, you know, security is kind of a big problem and it has these same issues of mm-hmm. we've got something that propagates over a network and humans don't reason about complicated movement across networks very well. So security became the next thing to work on. So for me, it's been the same problem for 35 years. Just each decade, I change the name of what we call it. But in all of these cases, it's how does something nasty spread around across a complex network? And right. so these days, when we look at cur- current security threats, you know, if you think about lateral movement, that's exactly what we need to be thinking about as security professionals. That, you know, how, how something bad gets into your network, then how it spreads and what you're going to try and do to stop it. Mm-hmm. Right. And, and that, that's where the analogy came from to think about immune systems. Right. As humans, we have really quite advanced immune systems, just like most animals do, because that's, how, well, that's what you need as a biological system to survive in this world. But our networks are way, way behind that. We really don't have an equivalent of an autoimmune system mm-hmm. for networks. And right. that, that's where we need to get to. We need to be thinking about how, how can we move in the direction of uh, that biology took over millions of years mm. to build up these immune systems that are so powerful. Matt, you had a comment? Yeah, so Mike, I assume the answer here is not to put a mask on your router and keep it six feet apart from <laughs> any other router. 
<laughs> now you've seen these people putting Faraday cages on 5G, right? It's like this is this is not going to work. Yeah, that's but, not the the right solution. It it's but, interesting but, though. The, 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 there are real lessons, right? I mean, uh, 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 the, the, there's certainly a little bit more we can say about what what coronavirus has taught all of us, right? Um, and what, what what's the core stuff we do about that? Well, there there are three main things we we've done about the virus, right? One is, well, we're all sitting at home, right? I couldn't come and visit your studio. I'm staying at home here in California right now. And so, so, so we, we have to uh, deal with social distancing. We have to deal with basic hygiene, you know, wearing a mask, washing our hands, and we have to get into contact tracing. Well, everybody's now learned about that. And th that's really important for security professionals, right? Those same lessons, you know, first, they're good things to do in security, to figure out how to get distance between things, to figure out what basic hygiene looks like, and then figure out how you'll do contact tracing, how you track the spread. It, but it's not just that. It's also a language that all of your executives and higher ups and the audiences we need to speak to, they've all learned this language too. So you can talk to them about what you're doing by comparing it to social distancing, basic hygiene, contact tracing, because these are terms everybody worldwide has suddenly had to learn. And that's unusual for us in security, right? We, we, we struggle a lot of times to communicate about our work with the people who pay for it. Mm. That's interesting. And, it's and also because you can't turn on the news today without hearing about the vaccine for coronavirus right. in some way, shape, form, or fashion. And I don't, you know, everyone, you're in control of your own body. I'm not going to tell you what to do with your body. It is completely your decision, and I will respect that at the end of the day. But when I was, you know, talking to Mike recently, I'm like, you know, I approach this like a hacker and a security researcher and a scientist. And I'm like, well, what does the data tell us about the vaccine? Let's put aside how you feel or believe about the vaccine. Totally fine. I'll respect that. But I was like, I want to do more research. Like, what is history? What does the previous data tell us? about vaccines to help me make an informed decision very much the same way we might look at a vulnerability or attack path in in our network what's the likelihood what's the impact what is historical data what is other data points like is there an exploit for that vulnerability tell us i think the decision about a vaccine for me at least and probably many of us that are that, that do this for a living that's what it came down to Mike, you had some great uh, commentary, of course, on this subject. Yeah, no, I, 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 I like your focus on what does the data tell us, right? It, mm -hmm. it, it is good to go and check this stuff. Um, you know, honestly, within a security conversation, um, I, it does force me to reflect a bit on this term zero trust that has become so yeah. trendy, mm -hmm. right? Um, it, uh, there, there's a good motive behind the zero trust movement, but what a terrible term, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah, it, it is. And anybody who's ever sat in a chair trusts, mm -hmm. right? <laughs> a, a zero trust lifestyle is an impossible lifestyle. It's insane, mm -hmm. right? You know, I mean, zero trust makes you an anti-vaxxer, right? Right, right. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> we, yeah. You know, the, 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 that's not a rational way to live, right? You, ha you have to go and examine the evidence, but some of that evidence will come from people that you then need to trust because you need to trust that these are scientifically reviewed studies, that we're all doing our phase three clinical trials properly and so on. Right. You know, and the, I, I the trusted Mike because I asked him questions about the vaccine and I trusted Mike based on his, you know, his background. It wasn't blind oh. to trust, right? But I trusted Mike based on his, his background. Yeah, so, so so you do have to go go where the data leads you, but and, and skepticism is a fine thing, but but skepticism isn't the same as zero trust, right? We, yeah. we have to calibrate. This is just like we learn with every security control. You have to learn not to overdo it, right? There's a risk with anything in security of overdoing it. I think zero trust sounds like a mantra of overdoing it, mm. right? All, all we really meant was trust a little bit less. Don't trust the perimeter. Mm -hmm. But the idea that it went under this banner of zero trust, I, I say, I, you know, that, that I, I think it's just absurd. It makes us sound uh, like anti vaxxers It makes it makes it sound like we no longer trust data. Mm -hmm. We no longer trust evidence. We trust nothing. Well, we we can't trust nothing. We 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 we, we yeah. So, <laughs> the, I mean, the, skepticism the, without education is just you become a conspiracy theorist, mm. right? You know, because it's uh, mm -hmm. you need something. To pair with that skepticism to to get to a place um, where where you're informed, and I, I think there are some really good parallels between that and, and a lot of the problems that that, that we have in security. Like, uh, for example, understanding ransomware. You know, a lot of people are scared of it. Everybody knows about it, um, but uh, there's not great understanding right now about how ransomware actually gets into the organization, how it spreads. You know, and once you start reading up on it, you find that oftentimes that attack begins weeks before you ever see the ransomware. There's lots of right. pivoting inside the organization. Um, usually it's not just the ransomware. There's at least two other categories of, of, 
of malware involved in making that happen. Um, and it's, it's much more complex. And just like COVID, you know, once you understand a little bit more about it, uh, you can be much better protecting yourself from it. Yeah, that's exactly right, right? The, the subtlety of how ransomware really propagates. You, when you really read up on it, you do feel like you're uh, thinking like a biologist, mm -hmm. right? You, you, you're thinking about, okay, well, first it'll do this kind of infection, and then it'll do that kind of lateral movement. And, and when you read about how a virus attacks our immune systems, and then how we fight back with our T cells and B cells and memory cells, it really sounds like the same kind of mechanisms. So that in a sense, our, our IT networks, as they get more mature, get more and more like biological systems. And you have to think about them like biological systems, right? Right. We're all used to this idea of, oh, we need to think like a hacker. If you want to be good at security, you have to think like a hacker. And that is certainly true. I'm, I'm not going to knock that idea. But I do think it's a good thing in this day and age to also think like a virus, right? If when you think about your own fabric, if you think about how ransomware spread around, think of the way, think about the way viruses think. Now, you know, we're anthropomorphizing, of course, right? But, but, but viruses adapt to the ways that their, their host animals, let's say humans, how they interact. Right? And so viruses get very, very good about uh, exploiting the fact that we shake hands, mm -hmm. that we breathe the same air in confined restaurant spaces, that we go through airports. And the, vi and the viruses that are successful are the ones that adapt to the way we actually behave. And so as a defender, you need to be able to understand the equivalent behaviors of your IT infrastructure, the same way that uh, public health officials have been in this rush to figure out, is it the restaurants? Is it the nursing homes? Is it the bars? And it turns out actually a lot of it is the bars and then singing in churches. I mean, who, who would have thought we have a disease that specializes in people who sing in church? Mm -hmm. but it, that really is very, very good for this particular pandemic as a, as a way for it to spread. So you, you have to think that way about what are the behaviors inside your network, thinking like a biologist, that will allow uh, threats to spread, and then what are you going to do to contain and limit them? Because again, when you think like a biologist, you don't think about perfect protection. You, you, don't, you don't try to say, okay, uh, if we need to evolve a better animal, what we'll do is we'll have iron skin. That doesn't work. It's too heavy. It costs too much. It's it's too difficult for, for humans to have armor-plated skin. We didn't evolve that way. We, we adapted to having fairly porous skin, but we learned to react effectively with T cells and B cells, our whole immune system. We've, we've evolved this complicated immune system to fight back when the inevitable insults come. And right? if so, we so could only have that in you know, enterprise security, it would be awesome. Because I, I think back, you know, when my kids first started going to school, they brought back all these new viruses and germs. And uh, my immune system was not prepared for that at all. But <laughs> once I got like one strain of, I mean, let's talk about norovirus or um, the other like stomach flus, my body kind of learned that, oh, that's, that's what that is, develops some antibodies. And the next time I get that, it might be a different strain. But uh, what, what I read and you kind of corroborated the, the, what I was reading, because every time I read something, I'm like, it's fake news, right? But my T cells are something that remembers like, oh, that looks kind of similar to this. So let me create those antibodies. And I might get it but not as bad. And I'm like, wow, if we could automate that in enterprise security, right. that would be really awesome. Right, no, the, exactly right. If, if, you, if you really get a handle on how the human immune system works, mm. it's obvious we don't have it in networks, but there are some moves that get us closer to it. But there are funny things, right? As a security industry, we got all huffy a few years ago about, oh, signatures are a failed approach. Signatures don't work. Mm. But what your T cells were doing there was mm -hmm. building up signatures, right? right? So your body is a complex mix of these patrolling T cells and B cells that are on the lookout for anything weird. That's how your white blood cells do what they do. They look for anything that looks funny and foreign, and they try and latch onto it and see if they need to kill it. Mm -hmm. But when they learn about a new virus, what do they do? They store a signature. The, the, these are the T memory cells that, mm -hmm. that appear to be very, very effective over the long haul, uh, even, even for this virus, right? That, that, that's how these uh, vaccines are working. They're, they're provoking us into making these memory cells mm -hmm. that learn a signature and then can stop it if they ever see it again by that continuous adaptive patrolling. So, so it's a mix of flexible patrolling that can learn new things, but also stored signatures, which you know, as I say, I, th th there was this big move a few years ago to say, oh, that we have to get away from signatures. We have to stop using them. What? Our bodies don't stop using them. Right. They're really effective. You you have to be able to eliminate things that you have learned, but that that means you need to learn, and we're, and that's something unfortunately we're still not all that good at. Mm. But let, well, let, let me um, toss toss out a positive point. Right, I've been making a lot of the negative points about a lot of this, but uh, you know we really don't have an immune system 
in network in digital networks. But one thing that I've seen recently that looks like a positive uh, evolution is how cloud fabric works. Mm. Um, all, all the work on orchestration and containerization in Kubernetes and cloud fabric, of course, that was designed to save money, right? It's, 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 it's all a financial push. But an interesting side effect of that, if you think about the way that you know, everybody uh, is familiar with the idea that cells in our body turn over, right? Now, there's a, a often repeated phrase about every uh, cell in your body turns over every seven years. That's not true, actually, but <laughs> but it's, a, it's a, the real story is a bit more complicated than that. But it certainly is true that you're not the same collection of cells that you were 10 years ago. Mm-hmm. Right? Uh, the, the average age of a cell in your body is about seven to 10 years. So we, we, we shed cells. Right, we're continuously renewing. We're the same people year after year after year, and yet all the cells are slowly being replaced. Well, some of them very quickly, some of them at a slower rate. Um, and um, but cloud computing is starting to get to some of that same idea of shedding cells. Right, this idea that you can spin up and down containers within milliseconds now. It, it, of course, we used to build data centers out of racks and racks and racks of gear, and it took a lot of time and effort to get more gear into those racks. And so the provisioning cycles were very long. But that meant dis- uh, you, because you put a lot of energy into making them, you also didn't dispose of them very quickly and easily. Right. But the way cloud uh, uh, infrastructure is now managed starts to look a lot more like disposable cheap cells. And this actually does improve some aspects of security. You don't need to do things like patch management on a Kubernetes pod-based workload. What you do is you go earlier in the uh, the, the uh, CI/CD pipeline. You, you, you do shift left, you go fix the vulnerability or whatever it was, and then you just deploy new images and wipe out the old ones. Mm. Well, I'm not saying that gives you a complete immune system, but it's a step in the right direction. That, that, right. That's a biological style of treating all the cells as throwaway. So, so all the, you know, we, we think of ourselves as very solid, but in fact, we're not. We're made out of disposable, replaceable parts, mostly. Mm. Uh, there's a few parts that aren't, like the brain. Uh, canonically, the brain cells and some parts of the eye and so on are not that easily replaceable. But most of the human body is designed for replaceability. And we're finally getting to compute environments that are, that are like that, that are designed for throwaway and replaceability, which I think is at least an optimistic sign of heading in the right direction. No, I agree. I think it shows the most promise of us to be more resilient, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, that, that's yeah, the idea probably- that... Go ahead, Adrian. The idea that the age of an asset uh, correlates with its risk. Mm. Right. No, I, I, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, the, 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 there's this term that um, the, the DevOps people have been using for a while that I find isn't well enough known in security. The idea of pets and cattle, mm. right? The, 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 this is the idea yeah. that, uh, you know, the old IT assets were, were, were pets. There were things we gave names to, and if they got hurt, they would take them to the vet and we'd patch them up. And, and most of our uh, heritage in security is managing computers as if they're pets. Most of IT was about pets. But when DevOps comes along with cloud and Kubernetes, they shift to a world where they, they do a lot more with cattle. These animals that you just put a tag on their ear, and that's all they get as far as the name goes. And if you they get sick, uh, you kill them and you get another one. Mm-hmm, um, mm-hmm. And so, so, so that, that that shift in thinking, I think, does improve some things in security. But it's not that the cattle then are everything. Uh, what you really need to understand is which assets in your environment are still managed like pets and which ones are managed like cattle. This isn't a right versus wrong. It's different parts of your company's systems are going to behave in different ways. And In fact, this is the point in the human body as well. Brain cells aren't really replaceable the same way that hand cells are. Hand cells get turned over really quite quickly. Gut cells are some of the fastest, right? So so different parts of the human body replace at different speeds, and some parts are super precious and can't easily be replaced, and so have to be managed a different way. And this is why we wear crash helmets, right? Mm -hmm. It's why why medieval uh, soldiers wore helmets, Mm -hmm. right? Because the brain part is a really, really highly sensitive part, so you approach security for it differently. And so the same thing has to happen. You have to understand which parts of your corporation need a crash helmet, because there's a brain in there that's really sensitive and really you need to look after it. And you can be a lot less worried about extremities that are easy to replace that DevOps can just say, oh, yeah, there's a, a bug there. No, no problem. We'll, we'll fix the bug and then deploy new resources and it'll be done before we finish this phone call. Yeah. Mike, what I'm curious is, does that change the way we have to think about architecting our networks and our systems? Because what you just said is, look, for those pets that are very, very important, I need to put them behind a bunch of cattle that can change frequently and often and disrupt the attack surface to provide almost a layer of protection to those areas that can't be replaced as easily. Do we have to think about re-architecting 
the way we think about our networks and our systems to allow those cattle to be on the outer edge to protect the pets on the inside. D- does that logically make sense? It, it, it does. Th- th- that is a good direction to go in. We've just got to be realistic, right? So, 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 so you're, you're right that if you can put more protection around the pets and worry less about the cattle, that's an improvement. But frankly, I could still punch you if we were in the same room, right? So the fact that you're made mostly of replaceable cells, well, I can still punch you pretty badly because you're still there, right? Mm -hmm. So just because so many of your cells are replaceable doesn't mean you're actually happy and willing to have them be replaced uh, by, by, you know, me me attacking you, right? That, 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 That would still hurt. Yeah, it's interesting, Mike. You're, now you're t- drawing on lessons my martial arts teacher told me years ago. And there's actually two that relate to this conversation. To exactly your point, he said, you know, a punch is only going to hurt if you're there to receive it. So don't right. be there to receive it, right? And that's how we would, the philosophy that we kind of went under. He also said, when you reach a certain level, he started teaching knife defense. He was like, look, you're going to get cut. Like, there's a lot of people that'll teach all that stuff. And he was very pragmatic about it. He's like, you're going to get cut. He's like, but... If you are going to get cut and you know it, maybe the bottom of your shoe is where mm-hmm. you want to get cut. And this speaks to replaceable. I can go get new shoes, right? Uh, growing a new foot is not in the realm of, I mean, maybe some experimental science, right? But I want the cut to be in the sole of my shoe so I can go replace my my shoe, right? That was kind yeah, of his th- philosophy. Th- that's exactly right. I mean, the, 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 these analogies, I, I think, really are quite deep. We've got a whole mm-hmm. chain of them here. Mm-hmm. But we have to figure out what to do practically. I, mean, I really love the way that your uh, martial arts teacher there was getting into practical advice, given that there are still people with knives. Yeah. Yes. Exactly. <laughs> so, 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 what what do we do? Well, to to understand that situation in in in, in combat, you had to understand where it's e- better to take damage and how to encourage damage to occur there rather than in your brain pan, which mm-hmm. would be really bad. So, what that means in most security teams is we have to get better at mapping out what our infrastructure looks like, what depends on what, what the likely attack pathways are, right? We we talked about ransomware and Mm -hmm. how it spreads. That too, if you can get some blast doors into your environment so that if you have a problem in one part of your network, it doesn't trivially spread over to the other parts in your environment, which means mapping out the different criticalities, knowing what's brain and what's bottom of your shoe, right? So, so you've got to get better at mapping. And this is, this is what I try to help people do, right? Mm-hmm. In, in practical work at, at Red Seal, I try and help people with mapping out their network because that's a key part of uh, uh, dealing with the lack of an immune system. So, so if, if you, the security team, have to be the immune system, if you have to be the T cells and B cells and go hunt everything down and, 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 and kill it, that means you have to have a good, reliable map of your infrastructure and you have to know how stuff can spread one of the difficult parts, of course, is knowing which are the important assets. I, I find most organizations still struggle with that a lot. And again, cloud is helping a little. It hasn't solved the problem, mm-hmm. but at least in cloud infrastructure, you get a lot more tags. You get a lot more metadata about, well, hopefully, who built this asset and why. Right. So sometimes all you get is mechanical descriptions, but but actually looking at the tags being used by your DevOps teams as they build out cloud infrastructure is actually a very great help in in identifying which things are more important and which things are less important. So so a good map of your equivalent of your your body's nervous system, the the IT equivalent of of mapping out the body, this is where you really need to start, right? It's, it's, It's not just inventory, it begins with inventory, but then you need to figure out how things are connected. You have to think biologically. You have to think about how a virus would spread through a system. So you, know, you, you have to be able to trace pathways. And, and, and so this is more rudimentary than the fanciest stuff we can think about in an immune system. But I think it's practically where people need to start today, just like your martial arts instructor trying to say, look, you know, there's some practical realities that are mm-hmm. going to be hard to escape, but let's at least control the damage so that we can be resilient and fight back. Mm-hmm. And that, that, that's the nature so- of the game today. So you're touching on something I, I wanted to kind of get your thoughts on uh, a bit more, you know, that I, I see another analogy between uh, uh, COVID and, and, and the network um, where, you know, I feel like you, you see a lot of the misinformation about the, the disease and you think, well, you know, if people had at least some foundational understanding of how the human body works, um, you know, the, these myths and, and this misinformation wouldn't be a problem because, you, you know, they're, they're just so ridiculous. If you understand even just a little bit about how the body works, you, you know that, you know, they're, they're 
physiologically impossible. Um, and similarly on, on the network, my experience uh, working as a consultant, you know, I was shocked at how often I could come in and into an organization and and know more about some of their systems and and how their their network is laid out and and how things work um, than people that work there because generally you find you know people know their small piece of the puzzle you know they know how their bit of the network works um, and, and there's not a whole lot of incentive to understand much beyond that um, so they they know it's thrown over the wall at some point and somebody else knows it and. And again, you know, uh, going back to my ransomware example, you know, I feel like um, to be prepared for any kind of threats that are coming in, you, I think the average, well, and this is where I want to get your opinion, you know, it, it, is it such that the average uh, company needs to understand their network a whole lot more than they do now? Well, especially the security teams do. Yeah, there, there, there are some very funny things about security, right? It, <laughs> One of the things I, I was slow to learn in this industry, took, took me a while to figure it out, is that really security is the only team that's uniquely obsessed with completeness, complete knowledge. As, as you said, right, every fiefdom has specialists who are very good at what they do, right? You might have a DevOps team who are specialists in Kubernetes in Google Kubernetes Engine, right? And they, and they really know that stuff stone cold. And they don't know jack about routing. They have no idea how packets get in and out of their fabric. Security, oh, that's somebody else's problem outside, right? I don't, I, don't, I don't think about that. I just make my application work, right? And so you've got all of these different fiefdoms, and each one of them has very good control of their environment, but nobody's taking care of the whole picture. And of course, we know right. that if, if you could only map 95% of your fabric and manage a security incidents in 95% of your fabric, what's going to happen? All of the threats are going to concentrate in the 5% you can't see, either because you've got very skilled adversaries, nation states or, and what have you, or through simple evolutionary pressure, the, the dumb attacks still work. And if you clean them out of 95% of your network, they'll just concentrate down into the 5% you're not looking at. Right. So so ignorance is absolutely a massive security problem. But you asked it a little more generally. You were thinking about, okay, well, do businesses need to get a whole lot better at this? Well, unfortunately, most organizations inside the business aren't that motivated to keep pushing Zeno's paradox. Right. Uh, uh, what, What do I mean by that? It's. You know, for most purposes, if, if you're in NetOps, let's say, well, you need a complete picture of everything for NetOps, right? If, if, if you need to keep, keep, keep availability up. Well, no, you kind of don't. 95%, 99% is good enough, right? That if, if you only have most of the assets managed, that's good enough to get your bonus, to get paid, you know, to, to be able to measure up time and, and move on. So 100% knowledge is something that really only the security team gets obsessed with because of the way the bad guys hide in the dark space. Mm-hmm. And no, no other team is going to fix that for you. So the security team is forced to be the data silo integrator. You have to go look at all those different data silos and pull the data together. And, you know, a, a lot of work has gone on in this business about quantifying security, quantifying risk. And there, there's whole other conversations we could get into there. I mean, there's no time for it in, the, in this call. But one of the things I did end up doing uh, almost as a side effect, once I learned some of the points you're bringing up there, um, is it's possible to quantify ignorance as well. We, we, we've actually put some energy in, in, in Red Seal in uh, what, what I refer to as quantifying ignorance. That is, we, we, we take on data from all these data silos. We compare the data silos, pictures of the world to each other. And because of that, we can identify known unknowns, things that the security team cares about, where you can tell there must be more fabric out there that's mm-hmm. not being managed very well. And um, you, you, you do this by comparing the data feeds to each other. If, if each team has a different view of the elephant, if the elephant is your company and each of the teams has a little bit of a view and you try and combine those pieces together and they don't make up a coherent elephant, um, more practically, if you try and map your network and what you get back is Hawaii, uh, you know, a chain of islands, that's not your network. Right? Uh, you can tell awesome. there yeah. are gaps and you mm. can quantify how bad the gaps are. So there really is a discipline within security about quantifying ignorance. And, uh, you know, I, I think that's, uh, you know, that's me reflecting y- y- your, your point and saying, yeah, businesses do need to do this, but it's really only the security teams who have to go and shine a light in all, in all the dark corners. Mm-hmm. And nobody else is going to help the security team do it. You really have to get good at interdisciplinary, interdata silo work to go solve that kind of problem. And, and me personally, that's what I really want to get out of a pen test, too. You know, and I, I, I don't think we get often enough. I've 
Um, in previous gigs, I've had companies tell me, look, every time we have a pen test, the pen testers just go straight after our active directory and they ignore everything else. And we've got this huge Linux infrastructure and we're worried that nobody's, nobody's looking at it. Nobody's telling us what we're missing there. Yeah. Um, Tony Sager uh, over at Sands these days, uh, I remember he, he had this great remark about the point of pen testing, the point of red teaming is not to get better at it, right? It's not that hard to break into networks and right. oh, people improve their defenses and you break in again. Big shock, people. <laughs> you know, when we try and yeah. break in, we always succeed. And I know within the security industry, we can chuckle about this and people outside are just horrified at this concept that we can always break in. But of course, the point of the break in is not simply to prove our prowess and to get better and better at breaking in. That's not what we're trying to do if we, if we don't work for the spy agencies. If you work, work in a real corporation, the point of the pen testing is to improve your defenses and figure out how to basically improve your immune system. How, mm -hmm. how can you use, uh, you know, the, 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 what, some of the points we talked about earlier, how can you use architectures that exploit cattle on the outside? pets on the inside where you can put a crash helmet around the really, really sensitive parts of your network. And you, you can only adopt those kinds of architectures if you understand your, your fabric. And pen testing can teach you some of that. It's not simply, oh, look, we captured the flag again. Well, mm. of course we did. We always do. Mike, uh, right. always a pleasure to uh, talk with you on all of our shows. It was, uh, it was really awesome for folks that want to learn more. You can visit securityweekly.com forward slash Red Seal. If you want to understand your network in many of the ways Mike has described, using awesome analogies, by the way, uh, please visit securityweekly.com forward slash Red Seal. Mike, thanks again. Always a pleasure talking to you guys. I really do enjoy these. Coming up next, uh, we've got an interview with Joe Ravella of Polarity Augmented Reality for your application. Stay tuned.